Hello everyone, DJ here. Today I'm going to talk about the Reserve Component Survivor Benefit Plan. This is one of the most important decisions that a service member uh, must make, and for that reason this episode will be a little bit longer than normal because I want to make sure I cover all the important details and explain it in a way that is completely understandable. I'm going to come at this from the perspective of an Army Retirement Service Officer, so some of the terms I use might be Army specific. However, the information I'm giving you will apply to all services. With that said, let's jump into the topic. By the way, I'm going to do this in a Q&A format, so the question will be like you're asking me, and then I will respond to the question. So, here we go. What is the Reserve Component Survivor Benefit Plan? To put it bluntly, retired pay stops when the retiree's heart stops. There's no such thing as passing on your retirement to a family member or a friend by way of a will or any other sort of legal instrument. The RCSBP, the Reserve Component Survivor Benefit Plan, is the only way that you can pass on a survivor annuity to a family member. Now notice how I phrased that. I did not say you're passing on part of your retirement. You're passing on an annuity that you are purchasing. And that is why I don't like when people say that, oh no, your retirement's being reduced. Well, no, it's not. If you think back to when you're drilling and you look at the deduction for the servicemen's group life insurance, is your drill pay being reduced or are you buying a product? You're buying a product. It's the same thing here. This is not your retirement. This is an annuity that you're buying for the benefit of your family or other beneficiary. So please keep that in mind as we go on. So when do I have to make this critical decision? If you have not already completed 20 years of qualifying service, then you've got some time to think about this. You don't make a decision right now. If you are well past 20 years of service, then the window has closed. You're not able to make an election at this point. However, if you are approaching the time that you would receive a 20 year letter, or you just recently received it, and by recently I mean less than 90 days ago, then you have some decisions to make very quickly. And again, let me emphasize, the window to make an election for the Reserve Component Survivor Benefit Plan starts the day you receive your 20-year letter, not the day it was published. So, you know, if someone tries to say, you know, you're two days late, this was published you know, 92 days ago, be sure to tell them when you actually got the letter. In fact, many times services will send the letter out with a, reserve, with a return receipt on the package and that would verify when you got it. Some services don't do that so don't rely on it. Anyway, now you have to make a decision and document that decision with your branch of service. What happens if I don't make an election in that 90-day window? Well, that all depends on when you got your 20-year letter in the first place. If you got it before January 2001, then the type of election made for you simply indicates that you're not going to make an election and therefore you will not have any beneficiaries until you turn 60. If you got that letter after or on or after January 2001, then the default is whatever would be most beneficial to your family. As I said in my episode, the notice of basic eligibility, this option will be made by your branch of service based on what they see in your personnel record at the time. This means you have the responsibility of keeping your records properly updated, of course. Now again, assuming that you got your letter in 2001 or later, don't assume that letting your election go into default 
just because it may be what you would have done anyway, is the right thing to do. Some components, like the Army National Guard, and often in radically different formats, will put a memo in your record stating what your default election has been, and some components won't do that. Especially when it comes to your survivors and trying to make things easier for them, it is always better to have a document with your signature on it rather than a form letter produced by some bureaucrat at state headquarters or national headquarters if you're not a National Guardsman. That signed document makes things much easier for your survivors who are already going through a tough, tough time. So please do the right thing for them. Okay, you say, I'll do it. How much will it pay my beneficiaries? All right, now here's the good news. RCSBP is based on your retired pay. It is 55% of whatever amount you set as what's called a base amount. The base amount can be anywhere from $300 to the full amount of your retired pay. Naturally, the higher you set that base amount, then the higher the annuity for your family will be. So if you set the base amount for $300, the annuity will be 55% of that, which is $165 per month. If you select your full retirement, and for this example, let's just say it's $1,000 per month, then your beneficiary will receive $550 per month. Does that make sense? I hope so. I know it's hard to understand numbers that are just thrown out there in an audio format. If, uh, if you think it would be more beneficial for you guys to see some visual uh, products, let me know in the comments and I will post those for you on my website to help make this more understandable. In fact, in a lot of cases, if you don't understand something, the answer is on my website under the resources tab. So, what will this cost me? For the Reserve Component Survivor Benefit Plan, or I'll just say RCSBP for now, since I'm pretty sure you get it by, by this point, giving an actual estimate of what the RCSBP will cost in monthly premiums is difficult because of the strange formula, not really strange, but the formula they use. It's based on the difference between your age and the age of your beneficiary and the type of beneficiary you chose. For simplicity, I'm not going to go into the math of that. Let's just give a few examples to give you an, an idea though. In most cases, the cost will be a dollar or two if the beneficiary is a child. It could be as high as 40% if you choose one of the very rare beneficiary types. I'll get into that later. But if you choose the most common beneficiary, your spouse, then it will be no higher typically than about 3.5% of your retired pay. When you consider that your beneficiary will get an annuity of 55%, this is not a bad return on investment at all. There is an upside to that cost though. Uh, you don't pay for RCSBP premiums out of pocket. You only pay when you start receiving your retirement. So for most reservists, that's going to be at 60. You get coverage from the time you have your letter all the way up until you start receiving your pay. So pretty good deal there. And, and then you, you know, start paying for it at the time you get your money. Also, the premiums come out before taxes. So uh, you'll save a little bit on tax withholding uh, as a result. Here's an example from an actual retiree. I won't give his name, obviously, but uh, his retired pay magically came out to an even $1,000 per month. He selected his wife as the beneficiary. She was one year younger than he was. And in his case, the RCSBP premium came out to be $30.40 per month. Well, that is naturally 
3.04% of his pay. This will come out of his retirement, so he has nothing to do right now. If he dies before age 60, his wife will receive $550 per month as a survivor annuity, and she will not have to pay anything for it. Only the retiree pays the premiums, not the beneficiaries. There will be taxes, of course, but she will not be liable for the premiums that accrued while he was living. Sorry, I had to interrupt. Someone came to the door. So anyway, if he does survive to age 60, then the premiums that had accrued from the time he got his 20-year letter up until he turns 60 will be added together. They'll be divided by 360 months or 30 years, and he will then pay that amount. As I said before, $30.40. And he will pay that until he either has paid 360 months of premiums or he passes away, whichever comes first. I'll save applying for the survivor annuity for another episode. Let's just move on for now. That still sounds like a lot of money to me. Wouldn't it be a better idea if I bought a life insurance policy instead? Servicemen's Group Life Insurance only cost me $29 per month for $400,000. While it's true that what you pay for SGLI is very low, that is not a benefit that you can take with you once you leave the service. You do have the option to apply for a Veterans Group Life Insurance Policy, but if you've ever looked at those rates, you'll see that they are prohibitively expensive. For example, a $400,000 policy for a 60-year-old man or woman, either way, is $432 per month, and that premium goes up every five years. By the time you're 75 years old, that premium is well over $1,800 per month. You can easily find better products out in the civilian market. And for those number junkies out there like me, there are but uh, there are calculators out there that can show you just how much life insurance you would need to match the value of SPP or RCSPP in this case. And those numbers are normally quite high. In fact, I'll give you an example here and you'll see that this can be a very good deal. RCSPP is a very good deal. Of course, when making a blanket statement like that, I do have to say that everyone's situation is different, so you'll need to make your own decision based on your individual circumstances. So let's do a comparison. SBP, RCSBP versus life insurance. I'll use the same retiree I mentioned a moment ago. If he were to die this year, he would be leaving an annuity of $550 per month to his widow Naturally, she would need more than that, most likely, to pay her monthly bills. But for the moment, let's work with $550. The survivor annuity is indexed for inflation. That means it goes up a little bit every year as inflation eats away at our money. The survivor, in 99% of cases, cannot outlive the survivor annuity. I say 99% because there's one way in which uh, a widow or survivor can be made ineligible, but that's only if they're under 55. So let's just say you can't outlive it. You can live long enough to exhaust a life insurance policy though. If, you, if this retiree, for example, had $100,000 in life insurance and the widow were to take only you know, $550 out of her life insurance policy, then she would run out of money in a little over 10 years time. If we assume that she needs more money, let's say $2,200 per month, that's four times the amount of the survivor annuity, she would run out of money in three years time. So in the first example, of $550 per month, the retiree would need to purchase a life insurance policy of $275,000 in order to 
<clears throat> in order to match the lifetime value of the survivor annuity. In the case of my second example, $2,200 per month, the retiree would need to have purchased over $1.1 million in life insurance before he passed away. Now imagine the cost of these policies for a 60-year-old person, man or woman, and you'll quickly see how, regardless of the premiums you pay for RCSBP, it's a good deal. Again, no one has the same financial circumstances, so do your own study of your own financial state and make an informed decision. Next question. What are the coverage options for RCSBP? Very simple, there are three. We call them options A, B, and C. Option A means that you are choosing not to make an election until age 60. Now, this is kind of dangerous. A lot of people do this because they think they're going to save some money, and they will save a little bit of money, but if they die before 60, the person they wanted to be a beneficiary will not receive anything. If you have a spouse, for example, and you want to choose option A, keep in mind your spouse must agree with this. The survivor benefit plans were developed for the benefit of the families, not for the retirees. So if you're going to, in, in essence, waive SBP, RCSBP until you're 60 years old, your spouse has to agree and sign off on that election form. Option B means that you're choosing to cover your beneficiaries and you want them to have an annuity. However, they will not receive annuity until the day you would have turned 60. This is another difficult one. I have seen a lot of people choose this one. And again, just like option A, the spouse has to agree to this before it becomes official. It can save you a little bit of money. However, it is generally a poor choice. I have had to sit in front of surviving spouses, look them in the eye, and tell them they will not be receiving a survivor annuity for 5, 10, even 15 years because their retiree spouse died well before age 60. This is very difficult news uh, on, the, on the lighter side for a counselor to deliver but even worse for the spouse to receive. This person's already going through some difficult times and now here's another piece of bad news that they are receiving. The only thing that could be worse is if that retiree had chosen option A and there's nothing in the future at all. Option C is, while it is the most expensive, um, you know, like I said, up to 3.5%, it is the best option generally for that survivor. This provides an immediate annuity to your survivor. Now, when I say immediate, uh, that's exactly what I mean. Even if you are 10 years away from receiving your retired pay, if you die now, your surviving spouse or other beneficiary will receive an annuity as if you were receiving your pay today. So you pay a little bit more, but there's more of a benefit for that survivor. Now, remember when I said, at least for people who got their 20-year letter on or after January 2001, that the most beneficial election is made for you if you do nothing in 90 days. Option C is what is chosen for them. Option C based on full retired pay. Now, even though I said that, remember, I also said it's better to have something with your signature than a form letter, presuming there's one there at all. So please make these elections in a timely manner and have them available at your higher headquarters and a copy available for your spouse. So if they need to make use of it, it's easily there, easily found, and they can do what needs to be done. All right, so those are the options. 
Who can be a beneficiary? Since I keep saying beneficiary over and over, who can be a beneficiary for RCSPP? Several years ago, I wrote a, a quick one-page description of this, which I'm going to post in the show notes. It's called RCSPP Fact Sheet. You can download that and give it to people who might be asking these same questions. I'm going to put a more expanded version of that in this particular broadcast to make things a little more understandable. Naturally, that other one I kept short because I wanted it to be one page. So anyway, here are the people who can be beneficiaries for RCSBP. The first is spouse. To be eligible for an annuity, your spouse must be married to you prior to the date of your death and married to you for at least one year prior to your death. If, if you divorce and get remarried to someone else, that one year starts over, just to keep that in mind. The next beneficiary type is child. This can be one child or several. If you have several, then the annuity premium will be based on the age of the youngest child. There's the eligibility for a child is to be under 18 or, if a full-time student, under 22. There's one exception to this age rule. If you have a child who is disabled and incapable of self-support, then you can choose to have this child as a beneficiary for RCSBP. Just keep in mind that there are other state and federal uh, types of assistance out there and they might be reduced if the disabled child is receiving this annuity. I'm not an expert in state and local and, and federal uh, welfare assistance, so that's something that you'll have to research yourself. An option that may help you with that would be uh, your own lawyer or consulting with the Judge Advocate General in your area, the JAG. Also keep in mind that if you are, let's just say, Navy Reserve and there's an Army National Guard JAG office nearby, you can utilize that service. You don't have to go to a branch specific JAG. That was a lot of information I know, but especially when it comes to disabled children, you, you need to do some research and get it right. Next beneficiary type, spouse and children. I don't think I need to go into anything more. It's just a combination of the last two that I described. All right, this next one. This next one's going to cause some firestorms for some people. The next option is former spouse. And I know there are a lot of people who say, why in the world would I give the survivor annuity to my former spouse. Well, sometimes it's a court-ordered thing, and sometimes it's a voluntary thing. You can choose to cover a former spouse. You can also choose to cover former spouse and children. Now keep in mind, if you want to cover the children of a prior marriage, you know, the children of that marriage, then according to the law in place right now, you have to cover both the former spouse and the children. There's no child only option in the case of a divorce. Also, if this is a court ordered uh, coverage, then either you or the former spouse can make the election. And one of you has to do it, otherwise there is no election. And if that doesn't happen, then you know, there might be you know, court issues you know, completely separate from survivor issues. If this is a court-ordered coverage, one of you must make the coverage election within a year of that court order. So please keep that in mind if you're going through any sort of divorce or court proceedings right now. One of you must make this election within a year it's not an automatic thing, and, and uh, you might face some contempt of court or failure to proceed or whatever they call it 
uh, on the court side if you don't make an election in the right amount of time. Now there's one more type of beneficiary. This is the one that is the most expensive because the plan was not really designed for these people. This category is called insurable interest. This can be anyone who is closer related than a cousin or cousin or closer and anyone who might have a vested financial interest in your survival like a business partner. This is a very expensive category. All the others are relatively low. This is the most expensive. The premiums for insurable interest can be a minimum of 10% up to a maximum of 40%. So you should think very carefully before making this option. And a caution, if you're completing the election certificate to choose a beneficiary, and you have a wife or children, you might see the insurable interest block and by default think, oh, here's a blank, I have to put something in it. Leave that blank. Do not fill out the insurable interest section or you're going to invalidate the whole election. I actually jumped ahead a little bit because the next question is, how do I enroll? Well, if you're in any reserve component except the Coast Guard Reserve, you would use Department of Defense or DD Form 2656-5, 2656 5 The title of that document is Reserve Component Survivor Benefit Plan, RCSBP, Election Certificate. If you're in the Coast Guard Reserve, you would use Coast Guard or CG Form 11211. Correction. Strike that. CG form 11221. And the title of that is Reserve Component Survivor Benefit Plan Option Slash Election Certificate. I've placed links to both of those in the reference notes below, so take a look at that if you're in the window to make an election. Now, I know this was a lot of information to absorb all at once. I'm going to call it quits for now. I hope this has helped a little bit in explaining RCSBP and that it's a little more understandable for you now. If, this, if there are parts of this that you didn't understand, then I ask that you take a look at that part of this broadcast again. And if that still doesn't help, then drop me an email or post a comment in the comments section and I will do my best to explain that piece for you again because, because this is something that everyone needs to understand. Naturally, if you want to make any other comments, I will welcome them. They are always nice to see. Next week, I'm going to talk about the survivor benefit plan, the sister to the reserve component reserve component survivor benefit plan. This plan covers you from age 60 and beyond. So please check in with me at that time and get that information as well. Thank you for joining me. Have a nice day and naturally thank you for your service. If you liked what you heard on today's video, then please go below and give it a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to this channel. Also, please let other people know about this channel and the information it can provide for them. If you have questions or comments, then please have no qualms about posting them in the comments section below. Please remember the RC Retirement YouTube channel and the RCRetirement.com website are not recognized or endorsed by the Department of Defense, the Department of Veterans Affairs, or any other government agency. The information presented in these resources are for informational and entertainment purposes only. Also, the content of either of these resources should not be considered financial or legal advice. Please consult with your own legal counsel or financial planner before making any decisions based on what you have learned here. As always, thank you for watching the RC Retirement YouTube channel.